I think restorative justice is bringing heart to justice, the, the term that we use so loosely about our, our legal system or how we engage in, in certain scenarios, basically. I think it brings heart to the whole process, basically, when the system that we have is a more punitive system, basically. It's, it's coming around thanks to the work that people like you you guys are doing, but it's, it's built on a more punitive system. And I, I think when they made that system, they didn't they didn't think of, that the system needed heart. And that's what I think restorative justice provides, basically. It provides the heart that is, that's needed in the system because we're all human beings. We're all, at the end of the day, we we have to get through this together in some capacity. So this is a, I think this is a great way to, to kind of help us work through the difficult parts of this this journey that we have to take together. I got involved with restorative justice kind of haphazardly. It wasn't my intention. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I was a part of a gang. Me and three other gang members conspired to rob a, a piece of delivery man. Uh, during that robbery, um, I ended up taking his life. I was captured uh, shortly after that. I, I was introduced to restorative justice. The concept of restorative justice by my victims, um, Dr. Kamisa's father, Azim Kamisa. When he forgave me for killing the son, he started a foundation, the Dr. Kamisa Foundation. He contacted my grandfather, who was my guardian at the time, to be a part of the foundation. They built on that foundation, talking to kids, uh, giving assemblies, sharing the story of, uh, of Tariq and mine, um, experience together. Uh, while I was incarcerated, I, I ended up doing 24 years uh, off a of 25 in life sentence. During my incarceration, of course, my grandfather provided me more information and insight about restorative justice, as well as a zine. Um, I worked with the foundation while I was incarcerated uh, in the best ways I could because of the, the limitations of my environment. I got a better understanding of restorative justice and was able to live it a little better once I was home and able to work with kids and kind of pay it forward. My grandfather on my behalf, but not, not at my request, to his own motivation, but on my behalf, wanted to do what, what he felt was right in that time. I couldn't see what was right as a 14-year-old kind of living in the, in the fog of a, a, a subculture, a gang life. My grandfather told me early on that Azim had forgiven me, that he wanted to speak with me or, or sit down with me at some point. I did not feel like I was ready, uh, nor was I comfortable with, nor did I think that I deserved uh, the kind of forgiveness that he was providing me at that time. It wasn't until, I would say like four years later, after my sentence and after being sent to prison, I was in Folsom State Prison when I made the decision that there needed to be some kind of closure for the Camisa family and I needed to be able to try to provide them some kind of closure if I could. So I agreed to, to meet with Azim. Um, he came to visit me when I was 18 years old, I believe. And we sat in the visiting room and talked about his life, talked about my life, talked about my experiences and talked about um, the night when I murdered his son. So it was a, it was a, it wasn't an easy journey uh, to get to that point. It was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work that didn't come with a, with a blueprint for me at the time. Yes, I do see that conversation that that's kind of the foundation of restorative justice. Uh, Azim talks about it a lot. He talks about forgiving, period, in order to heal yourself, basically, and to kind of bringing the community, involving the community in it, and involving the the person who committed the harm, myself. That was my first personal experience with restorative justice, yes. We, we hear about it a lot um, when I do speak about it. I think most people's experience with restorative justice is through um, stories or fables or even our religious culture, um, our religious cultures and traditions that teach us forgiveness or teach us these ideas about how to restore the family or the community. But they're they're kind of high-minded, basically. They're, they're difficult for us to touch because they're, they're things that are happening to people in a time that we don't exist anymore. And we, we see those people as greater than ourselves, basically. But in this moment, I knew who I was. I never saw myself as some great entity or great being in this life, or even in my own life, basically. And here was Azim, a humble man, who, whose son was taken away from him. And he, and he took the time to forgive me and help me work through my own challenges so I can begin to forgive myself. But it helped me see that forgiving myself was possible. The move from tragedy to triumph is possible. It helped me see that there is growth even in the, the difficult parts of our lives, basically. The, the poor choices that we make, the hurtful things that we sometimes do to one another and to ourselves, that there is there can be growth in that. And you can transform and change yourself if you if that's what you want to do. I think the restoration with the Camisa family started off with the honest communication with Azim about what transpired you know, in those last moments uh, of his son's life. 
um, when you when you deal with a court process, the the court process kind of sterilizes the involvement of everybody else that's involved. They kind of take over the the process itself, so it's no longer about the victim or and the perpetrator. It's about the the courts being wronged in some way, basically, if that makes sense. So I think what gets lost in that process is that. The, the people that committed the crime, the perpetrator, basically is trying not to be sent to jail. So they're, they're, it's not always an honest process from that perspective. And then the people on the prosecution side, they're trying to do whatever they can to, to send somebody to jail. It's not always, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not always honest. It's not always nurturing. It's not always a free flow of communication. So I don't necessarily feel like that process is for the healing part that that is needed when something like that happens. So I, I think that the honest communication about what, what happened in the last minutes of Azim's son's life, the last minutes of Tyrek's life, was the, the starting point of starting that process. From that communication, we were able to kind of grow as human beings together, basically, get to know each other. Uh, Azim, Azim is way more, <laughs> of course, he's older and he's had more life experiences than I had at that point. And so he was much further along than I was. But I think those communications, his his willing to hear me out and sit with me, and my although reluctance to to sit there and have that conversation with him, I think that that strengthened our relationship or our connection kind of past the the, the murdering of his son. I don't know what I can say to to change somebody's mind about uh, something like this because, for, hey, it is different from what we're what we're used to on the ground. So I understand that some people will have difficulty with it. The only thing I can say about restorative justice is how it has impacted me. I know what my trajectory was in life. I was a 14 year old kid. I was given, I, I incurred uh, a 25 to life sentence. I never expected to ever come home again. The environment that I was in was one of supreme negativity. And I expected myself just to wallow in it and, and, and be a part of it. Um, it was restorative justice. It was the, it was a kinesis that kind of, it was my grandfather and, and my support system, but they kept me afloat and they kept me from becoming one with the with the dross and the, the waste that I was kind of floating in at the time. So all I can speak to is how it has affected me and the changes that it has made in my life and, and the relationships that it has strengthened in my life. So I, I know it works. I hope other people are, are kind of look into it and, and see how we can work for them. It's not, it's not a light switch that I clicked on and I just figured myself, no. It's a conscious thing that we've done. And it's, it's, some days it's a little difficult than others. I made a lot of mistakes in my life and I, I lost a lot of time. And I, 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 I took some time from someone and I took some things from other people. So I've, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conscious thing that I work towards in my life. And it's not easy. And that's the work of restorative justice. That's another thing too. And that's another reason I feel like it's uh, some people are so maybe a little dismissive of it because it, it takes... It takes difficult emotional work sometimes, especially if you have a lot of stuff down back. But we're more we're more comfortable with conflict than we are with peace um, sometimes. And um, I think we've done a great job as a species, basically, to try to move towards peace in incremental ways. But we we, we tend to slide back towards well, our comfort level, and the, our comfort level is the easiest thing for us to do: to lock them up, to throw away the key, to kill them before they grow, type thing. But the, the restorative justice part of it, the, the living in the feelings, the living in the emotion of what's going on in the moment, and the, the trying to figure out ways to make the, to bring solutions to the problem that benefit everybody that's involved in the problem is a little bit more difficult, basically. So it takes a little bit more work. I sincerely believe in the work that is being done on the behalf of restorative justice. I believe in the work that uh, the Thorough Kamisa Foundation is doing. And I believe that the, the change that we can bring to our communities if like-minded people like ourselves come together and, and do the hard work.